let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I don't have special announcements, uh, so we can get started. I will just a quick reminder that this Friday is a drop deadline when we can withdraw with the course without any record of that. Um, I hope you all have a better sense of is this a course you're interested in? Is this something that you can handle uh, this semester? Um, yeah, and I want to move forward. We have still a little bit more to say uh, about tokenization. I just want to go over uh, the, the Python code. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time for you to run this code and to examine it. But um, depends how you learn things. I, I think a lot of you, because you're CS major, majors, majority of you learn by actually coding. Uh, so I recommend running uh, this code for yourself. Uh, last time we just had the, uh, we look at this uh, text that we have a first split into a list of characters, which is the first step in BPE uh, tokenizer. And then to implement our token learner, uh, remember, that's the part of the algorithm where we are merging most uh, frequent uh, adjacent uh, elements in a current tokenization. Um, I should also mention something now I realize, uh, which came up um, in questions uh, after the lecture. Um, so let me go here. So while we are doing the token a learner, uh, and while we are merging, um, doing merging operations, effectively what you are you doing and what we care about is the production of the vocabulary and production of merging rules, which are not visible in all of these slides. So here, these are the merging rules, which you will later use to tokenize sentence. You will go through them uh, one by one and apply them to a given text you want to tokenize. So keeping the track of merge rules is important, which was not uh, very highlighted when I was um, walking through uh, walking you through this example. And another thing that's happening that's uh, important when to kind of connect to the Python code I'm showing you is that while we are doing this merging operation on a corpus from which we are learning merging operations, Effectively, what you are doing is the tokenization of that corpus into the vocabulary you have right now. So here uh, we have, uh, for example, ne, comma, w, comma, er, uh, underscore. Uh, that's basically current tokenization of the word newer, given the vocabulary you have. Uh, I think that was a little bit confusing because here I'm starting with a corpus from which I will learn merging rules. Uh, but I'm also uh, referring to some tokenization, and I think that was confusing last time. So while we are learning the merging rules from the corpus that we initially tokenize into set of into characters because our initial vocabulary is just set of characters, uh, as we are applying merging rules, we are also producing tokenization of that text. Okay, and this is why uh, the list of these uh, characters uh, from made from our original text here is labeled tokens. I, I use the variable tokens. Okay, so we had uh, getting stats was the operation which counts frequency of two uh, tokens in the current tokenization of our corpus. Uh, then we have our initial vocabulary, which we said is going to be the set of characters. Again, one thing I didn't emphasize last time is that when we are doing this in practice, we use a massive corpus, a massive collection of written text. So it will happen that all of your characters in the alphabet are going to be usually part of your vocabulary. Now, um, I also said that we will always be able to um, tokenize any text because we can write it as a combination of characters, right? And every word can be just split in a list of characters. And uh, after the lecture, someone asked me a great question. They didn't maybe uh, realize how exactly we can do that because the, the merging rule doesn't include, it's always uh, is a pair of two characters, right? Or two symbols. So uh, how do we ensure that 
any combination of two characters is in our merging uh, rules. That might not happen. And in actual implementations of these BP tokenizers, there is something called a character, uh, character fallback. Basically, if you are unable to uh, tokenize your string into the tokens you have in the vocabulary using the merging rules you have used, you always have an option to just represent it as a list of characters in the order they appear in that string. All right, um, then uh, the next thing we ha have seen is how to actually uh, retrieve the most frequent uh, pair of uh, consecutive elements. And we have defined the merging operation. Again, the merging is happening at the, in a current uh, tokenization of our corpus from which we are learning, where we are replacing two uh, consecutive elements in a list with a single uh, symbol. This means we need to create a new Python list because we won't be able to uh, iterate over the original one if we had uh, replaced two elements with one. Okay, and we stop, uh, stop about here when we said, okay, uh, we want to have uh, some desired vocabulary size, uh, which uh, because we have our initial set of characters, then the number of merges you're gonna uh, do, additional merges to reach the vocabulary size you want can be defined through vocabulary size minus the length of your vocabulary. And then you are doing these uh, merging uh, operations and is as, uh, as you are finding new symbols that you are merging, uh, you need to also add them into vocabulary. And very importantly, you need to keep track of the merging operations, which we'll use later by looking at, aha, uh -huh, this merging operations tells me if I see these pairs of two tokens, I should merge them. And this is what we are gonna use uh, later on. Um, so yeah, uh, basically what I just said is what the token segmenter does. It's uh, an operation where given a string, a new string, you want to tokenize it given what you just learned from the token learner. And this is basically applying the merging rules in the order you have them uh, recorded. So first merging operation is gonna be applied first. Okay, so I recommend going through this. Uh, again, uh, I mentioned that I will stress it again. In this Python implementation, we didn't care about word boundaries. This is something we typically also care about. So there are a few little extra implementation details that you need to care about. But what I wanna today mention is the uh, Hugging Face uh, tokenizer. So. First of all, Hugging Face is a company that in um, 2018, approximately when uh, pre-trained language models has started to become a thing, which are basis of large language models today. Uh, one of those that was that made a lot of change in the NLP community is called BERT. And we will learn about BERT at some point. We didn't learn anything about it yet, um, but it made a big uh, stride. And then this company has started, they wanted to produce an implementation of the of BERT and other pre-trained language models that will uh, enable researchers and engineers to easily use these models. Since then, uh, they have become the company that produces software that we need for open source development of uh, current AI technology. So uh, if you want to train you know, vision diffusion models, if you want to train audio models, if you want to train uh, language models, Hugging Face has most code you need, your starting point is whatever Hugging Face has, and then you build on it. So Hugging Face also has tokenizers uh, library. It provides an implementation of today's most used tokenizers with a focus on performance and versatility. It also have, they also have uh, data sets, a library where basically you can easily uh, load um, commonly used data sets um, in uh, AI research. Here, I just want to show you how you would use tokenizers, how you would use Hugging Face to train a BPE tokenizer. And I recommend doing this, not implementing something from scratch. I, I think it's important for you to look at implementation to understand, you know, maybe clearly what's going on. But in reality, you won't be implementing these things for, on your own because uh, performance is really important here. You want to be tokenizing fast. And why would you write code if there is code already, right? 
So if you want to use a uh, Hugging Faces tokenizers library to train a BPE tokenizer, you are going to first load the BPE class um, and uh, make uh, an instance of that uh, class here, tokenizer equals tokenizer BPE. Um, as we said uh, at some point, we need to do pre-tokenization, which is going to be white space pre-tokenization. Other tokenizers, subword tokenizers, may have different choices of pre-tokenization. And actually, if you look at the code base for GPT-4 tokenization, you will see there are many other rules uh, that they use. And I will point you to a library where you can be checking those rules. So you say, OK, I need my pre-tokenizer. And for BP, I want to use white space tokenizer. And uh, then you just uh, set uh, the, the pre-tokenizer variable of your tokenizer to be white space one. So this is an example of how the white space tokenizer implemented in Hugging Face works. And this is great because it's a slightly better version of the most naive white space tokenizers where um, you would not separate punctuation from the word it is attached to. So this is this is something better. All right, and then you are gonna uh, train your BP tokenizer. And here we are, just a moment, we are actually um, using a realistic data set. Wikitext is a very common data set to, you can use to train a tokenizer. It's a collection of Wikipedia texts. And you know how abundant Wikipedia text is, uh, texts are, right? Um, I personally always end up in rabbit holes on Wikipedia. Um, so what you need is you need to load the data set, the corpus, and here uh, we didn't learn about what batching is yet. We are going to learn today, but batching basically means if uh, I'm going to split my data into chunks of it, uh, chunks of the size, batch size, which here is thousands. So you can imagine we are splitting, if you have like a Wikipedia as a very long sequence, you are splitting it in chunks of thousand words. Okay, um, that's that's one thing. And then here, all you need to do to actually do the token learner operations we were doing is to call a training operation for the tokenizer. And here there is a specific uh, function trained from iterator, which just means for efficiency, instead of giving all the data, they give data in batches and aggregate results uh, later. So, you do that, let's see how long that's gonna take. Pretty good. I'm personally happy, maybe you're not as happy because you didn't see how gigantic this data is. And now let's use it. So to, uh, to uh, get our tokenization, we call the encode function of our tokenizer. And here we have, hello y'all, how are you? With the happy emoji question mark. And let's see what it gets. It gave us, us the following tokenization. So it's almost like a word tokenization, except that hello is split into two subwords, right? So hello seems like a word that's not super frequent in Wikipedia. Personally, it makes sense. Why would we see a lot of hellos in a Wikipedia? And therefore, it is combined from two uh, subwords. Any, anything that happen, happened here that we are noticing that we are unhappy about? Yep, emoji. emoji disappeared, how sad, right? Um, this happened, uh, okay, question, why did this happen? Yep. Sorry, can you say louder, I don't hear you. Oh, it is, uh, the model thinks un it's unknown, but I said, and apparently I lied, that every every everything will be represented, that there will be no unknown words. So how come now there is an unknown word? Yeah. Did verify there's something else? Something else than what? Exclamation mark with the letter N. Mm, no, 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 not that. It wasn't. As again, I told you, subword tokenizer. We introduced it exclusively to handle unknown words. And now we had unknown something and we didn't handle it. So how come? I think they were first. But maybe the move is because it's a little character that the token is not the same. 
yeah, it's uh, almost there. So actually emojis cannot be represented by characters. So this is the issue. Uh, it's not, uh, we, we have initial set of characters and we indeed can represent uh, words with characters, but emojis themselves are not represented by characters. And we would need to go lower, lower to something like bytes. So if we initially started with our vocabulary being bytes, then we could represent emojis, which we didn't do. So to repeat, subword tokenization will handle all unknown words. But what I mean by unknown words is words that can actually be composed by characters in a given al alphabet, which is not the case here with uh, emojis. And there are ways to handle emojis. Here, they just ignore them. Uh, which is also not great because, for example, if you care about sentiment classification and it's, you know, encoded with a lot of emojis that are happy, everything is great, that's a huge, uh, you know, signal of positive text, right? You had a question before that I ignored. Mm -hmm. You tell me when to stop. Okay. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, so I believe this is the offsets for characters. So um, here, zero and four, if you return to the original string, it tells you um, you can retrieve the token from the character positions. So beginning and end of the word this is given by characters in your string at the position zero and four. And then is is at five and and uh, seven and so on. Um, trying to think, um, so, sorry, this is this wasn't clear. Um, this is one, um, it's a end of, uh, in, so seven here is the index of the uh, character S plus one to, to know where the, the end is. Um, I'm trying to think why this is important. I know this is important. I, I had issues with this. Um, Sometimes there are issues where you have tokenized text and you need to recover the original text. I think this has to do something with that, but I'm not 100% sure. So I can't give you a concrete example, but this I know that this having this character offset can be useful in certain problems you have down the line. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay, which one word do you want me to display? Uh huh. Uh huh. So here, let me just to make sure I have all of them. Mm -hmm. And do you want me to change anything in this string? Uh huh. Oh, we have extra extra uh, space. Yeah. Let's do it. Uh huh. I will do it like this. It's gonna be easier to catch the difference. Okay. All right. So. Let me see. Hello, how are you? It's not printing all of them, right? Okay, so um, where is uh, where did we add the space? Is it here? Nine. Yeah, so we have extra space before 15, and then uh, we do have different offset. Um, but I'm still trying to think like, why, why is this helpful? But this is pre-tokenizer. This is just splitting into words. So are you thinking here? So if I hear, if I, hmm? 
Yeah. Any other thing? <laughs> Anything else you want me to try? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why is this so change? Okay, and before we had same. Yeah. Yep. Integers. Very good. Um let's see. Are we happy with this? Who can tell me why we are not happy with this? Yeah, so here we, this should be one number, right? It's split into two tokens. And then this is also not a single number. And this is the reason why we have handling, using language models for mathematical uh, operations requires uh, extra care. And we need to include uh, numbers, a lot of number data into our corpus that we are tokenizing to, to, for it to learn from as well, which is a great segue into uh, this slide on all the uh, tokenization issue. I hope to talk more about this, but you have the uh, video by Andre, so make sure to, to watch it if you are interested in a more you know comprehensive explanation. But um, going back to the, to the list of the problems that he had outlined in his lecture, you can explain them, a lot of them, by tokenization issues. And to do that, maybe a good exercise for you would be at home to try a lot of this example in this um, application where you can see how uh, certain language models are tokenizing text, including the latest and greatest like GPT-40, uh, uh, which is the current model of uh, ChatGPT. So sometimes when you notice weird issues that you deem, oh, I can explain them how this can come from tokenization, you can actually check here how, how GPT-4 tokenizes that uh, sequence. Um, also, I didn't mention um, this tick tokenizer comes from the library tick token, very cute, uh, developed literally by OpenAI. So here you can find out a lot about how they themselves are tokenizing text or building uh, large language models like uh, GPT-4 that power chat GPT. Um, Andre has also developed a little uh, GitHub repository with what he calls um, uh, MinPE, uh, which is a nice, like, clean implementation of the BPE tokenizer. I think a great starting point. Uh, then again, Hugging Face has a lot. So here I have linked to the library tokenizer. I, I provided you with a notebook by Hugging Face folks on how to use their library. Uh, or for bit specific examples. And they have actually a whole uh, course on tokenization where you can learn way more about uh, tokenization uh, in general as it applies to LLMs uh, as well. But yeah, just to go back to some of these things, why can't LLMs spell uh, words? Well, actually uh, some of these words that LLMs can't spell, uh, it happens that the tokenization is such that it represents the whole word with a single uh, token. And then um, the model struggles with breaking it down into smaller units. If you ask the same LLM to actually write a Python code to, um, to, to spell words in a, in a string, uh, to spell, yeah, to spell a word, uh, and then to run that uh, same Python algorithm it wrote to answer this question, then it will do it uh, successfully. So this is where these differences come from. If, if it relies on its own tokenization and everything, it can uh, break down. Um, we have seen how, to uh, how tokenization can influence the ability to handle uh, arithmetic. Um, um, uh, I have mentioned last time that the difficulty for the writing code comes from white space, not, not having a single token for chunks of white space, which we know are important concept in uh, programming in Python, and that throws the uh, model off. And then there are these special tokens I didn't talk about. Sometimes we introduce them to signal to the model to tell us when it stopped generating something to kind of 
cut the string output string uh, by that position and say whatever was uh, that uh, was generated before end of to text token as our output, for example, in ChatGPT. But if you use that same token as an input, the model has learned to associate that token with that's the end, like I should not be doing anything after. And again, it can um, cause uh, problems. There is many other things. This is a funny one. There are these tokens that are, we call them glitch tokens that are special. They come from, again, um, the model deems them special because of the way the, the tokenization um, works. And then uh, you can use them maliciously to make models do all sorts of things. Okay, um, just a few more things on the um, uh, tokenization. It's a it's a massive field. I if you are interested in the topic, I recommend uh, checking out this sur survey, uh, which is wonderful. And here you can see that there are multiple dimensions. What we have covered they are only these kinds of tokenizers, uh, such as BPE, uh, which has different uh, assumptions and are data uh, driven. But there are many other other things, and especially if you are looking at something more cutting edge, where, for example, researchers think, could we, instead of providing these tokens, provide an image of a text to a model to kind of handle this all of these uh, tokenization uh, issues? So a lot is still going on uh, over here. We also didn't learn about many subword tokenizers. I told you only a single one. You will commonly see with language models, uh, workpiece tokenizer that differs from the BPE by which rule it is uh, it uses to uh, do the merging. Instead of taking the most frequent adjacent pair is using something we didn't learn about yet. So uh, I don't wanna I don't wanna talk about it. Uh, then again, there is a Unigram LM. We didn't really learn what an LM is yes, uh, yet. And sentence piece, which is an, an implementation of BPE that um, is um, should handle multiple languages better. So the point is that there is a lot going on in tokenization. You learn one very common tokenizer powering one of the most powerful LLMs uh, today, but you know, I would also want you to be not be confused if you see, oh, this LLM was trained with the word piece or they're using uh, a sentence piece. Okay, so there is that's that about tokenizers. Are there any big pressing issues um, uh, that um, are still confusing? All right, so let's move on then to another topic. So I'm still, uh, you know, until we reach out language modeling, so for a couple more lectures, basically what we are doing is building this, uh, this slide. With this slide where we had uh, components of a supervised machine learning uh, system, where we are going to see uh, more more examples of of these um, things in the first and the second step. So we have learned logistic regression, and we have learned how to find weights of the logistic regression. And today we are going to talk about another uh, classification function, which is feedforward neural network. Uh, we are also going to start moving in direction of multi-class classification, which will be important building block for language modeling, the task of language modeling, uh, because there we won't have one class. We will have as many classes as there are tokens in the vocabulary. Um, and we are also going to see how to do neural classification, classification by using neural network as a classification function. And to do that, we are first going to talk about nonlinear transformations, which will be the way to motivate neural networks. So what you're seeing here is um, a classification problem. Uh, you see the same problem on the left and uh, right, but the decision boundary is different. So here we have linear decision boundary, and here we have a nice nonlinear decision boundary, right? Obviously, this one is better, right? Here, all uh, all instances which are colored blue, meaning they belong to that class highlighted with blue, are actually classified as blue instances, whereas here we have a portion of them which are classified as red instances, 
which is wrong, as well as a portion of red instances, which are classified as blue instances. Okay, so now we learned that for certain problems, linear, classic, linear decision boundary is simple insufficient. And how neural networks are doing finding these decision boundaries is by finding nonlinear transformations of this space. This means that you are finding um, operations which uh, are bending or making some weird non-line looking transformations, such as one here. And once you kind of uh, bend it and do something, you manage to actually separate these two uh, uh, classes of instances, which are now linearly separable. So here now you can actually use a linear classifier. So the idea is, Take your, take your representation of your inputs, linearly transform them, non-linearly transform them into new vectors, and then classify those vectors with a binary linear classifier. Uh, excuse me, with the linear classifier, binary only if you have a binary classification problem. When you are transforming these original vectors non-linearly uh, and resulting vectors are often called in this line of work, deep learning, as, uh, as uh, latent or hidden vectors or latent or hidden representations. I'm gonna be using uh, terminology vectors and representation interchangeably. And this space, this new space where these new vectors live is called hidden or a latent feature space. What does it mean that they are latent or hidden? It means that once you do these operations, you don't really know anymore what these dimensions are representing. So numbers that are in these newly non-linearly transformed vectors and are no longer interpretable. We do not know what information they are encoding. In that sense, they are hidden, latent. So how do we do this? Uh, this is a mathematical operation that shows us non-linear transformation. So we have f of x as always being our uh, feature vector and dimensional feature vector. Uh, then we have a matrix and uh, we uh, multiply this matrix with this uh, vector. Matrix is a, this is just a linear transformation. So if you have D times N dimensional matrix and you multiply it with N dimensional vectors, you are gonna um, end up with, mm, this is not quite right. Uh, you, you are gonna, and okay. I confuse myself uh, in a silly way. So n-dimensional means n times one. So what you end up with is a d-dimensional vector, right? So um, yeah, that should be clear. I don't know why I confuse myself. So uh, after this, you get a vector of dimension d, and then you apply a nonlinear function uh, point-wise to this vector. And in this way, you got a vector which is d-dimensional and uh, lives in this newly nonlinear hidden latent space. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you this visualization and we are gonna go over this again. This visualization basically shows you uh, what is happening uh, when you do these operations. So when this, when this illustration begins again, when it resets, it happens very quickly, so try to do it fast. Pick one vector, pick some vector in originally in the start of the animation, and then try to see what happens with it when, as we stretch the space, shift it and bend it. So it's gonna happen now. So pick maybe something over here and look, the vector is extending, 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 pointing still in similar direction, shifting. Shifting, 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 stop shifting. <laughs> and now it starts to bend. So we, this original vector that I personally picked has extended, maybe it's uh, changed the direction slightly, it shifted and it also uh, bended. And this is exactly what's happening to vectors if you do this sequence of operations. So when you do a uh, matrix vector computation, uh, the matrix, what it does with this vector is uh, producing a new vector, which is the output of the matrix vector computation, 
And effectively, this matrix had scaled, rotated, or otherwise linearly changed the original vector. Uh, the bias term B, which I remember, I usually fold it with uh, the weight matrix. So this is the one of the last times I will be bringing it up again. But it just shifts the vector in this uh, in the newly linearly transformed vector space, and it's going to shift all uh, points uh, by the same amount in the same direction. And then finally, we have this pointwise application of our nonlinear function, uh, with where the nonlinear function it can bend, stretch, and compress different parts of this uh, linearly transformed space, which are not linear operations. One thing which is super important for you to remember is that when I say linear transformation in your head, you should be, if I say linear transformation of vector, let's call it uh, X, immediately in your head, you should be, oh, she's multiplying uh, this vector with the matrix. I won't be spelling out this every time. I, I will from now expect that you know that. And this is gonna be our shared language. Okay, is this clear? Yeah. In the um, I wouldn't use the topology terminology just because I'm not super familiar, you know, not familiar, but like comfortable just using that language. What does it exactly mean when we talk about topology? Um, it just means that, um, so here, you have these operations where basically, um, if you mathematically, how we define linear operation is uh, through a sequence of properties. So if we say this operation is linear, we need needs to fulfill that uh, applying that operation to a sum of two vectors equals to applying the, uh, the same operation on them independently and then summing their linear transformation. If you have, uh, if we apply it to a vector that's whose magnitude is scaled by, let's say C, then it's the same as linearly transforming and, and multiplying by C. So this is what linear transformation means. And uh, operations like scaling, rotating, and so on can be described, uh, you know, they fulfill these properties. Now, all of these other stuff I mentioned here do not fulfill these properties and they are non-linear. And you're right, probably, you know, it, I mean, it, it has a relation to changing the topology, but I don't want to define topology and then, you know, be extra precise here because I will probably fail. Yeah. Question. So where does uh, the bias appear? Uh, so it appears once we start shifting this uh, space, the, uh, the data points in this space. So you see here we are scaling uh, straight like scaling and then now here is where the bias term comes it just shifts the vectors by the same amount so instead of um i don't know imagine point in a vector that starts in an origin you shifted everything by some amount yeah so uh, remember when we talked about logistic regression, I said, I'm going to fold them, these bias terms. I'm going to add additional dummy variable and uh, set it to one. And then uh, basically when I have a W time F of X, I can, one time my F of X includes its dummy variable, it's the same as having the bias term. So I don't want to keep dragging the bias term. That's my personal choice. So you can just imagine that that's what we did here. Good question. Okay, so uh, what are our nonlinear functions? Here are some common choices. Uh, which one did you see previously? Tell me the letter under it. A, perfect. So someone else, what's the name of this function? Sigmoid, very good. So we already seen uh, one nonlinearity. It's the sigmoid function. It's a nonlinear function that squashes everything uh, between zero and one. And it has uh, this property that it saturates uh, at uh, very negative and very positive numbers, which are then turned into zero and one. Related is a 10H function, which just squashes it to uh, between minus one and uh, one. Both of these functions have uh, an issue. Um, let me remove this to not give away an answer. So 
Uh, we have learned that we are doing optimization with gradient descent and calculating gradients, or in this case, derivatives is very important, right? So what is the derivative of, uh, of, uh, uh, of these functions, uh, sigmoid and 10 h uh, at these um, regions where we have very flat, where they are very flat? Zero. Can you give us a, like a visualization trick we can use to see that it's it's zero? Just flat, right? Yeah. So so again, uh, derivatives and gradients give us the slope uh, of the function, and the slope here there is no slope, right? It's like flat as a pancake, so it's zero. And this is an issue because. When we do our optimization, we said we are going to move in the direction of the steepest uh, descent, which is given by the gradient or derivative, uh, actually negative derivative or negative gradient. And if our gradients are zero, then we are not changing the weights and we are stuck in a place, which not might not be good if we are not actually in, at the minimum, right? So most commonly used activation function is a ReLU, which is a very simple one. Uh, it's identity function except at uh, negative values where it is uh, zero. And when I first learned about it, I was like, wait a minute, this is like piecewise linear, like this is not really nonlinear, what's happening here. But actually when you combine a lot of, um, because um, we'll see that we'll have deep neural networks. So the output of one uh, nonlinear transformation will be input in another nonlinear transformation and so on. Um, so when you are doing composition on uh, linear piecewise functions, you can get something which is uh, nonlinear. The great thing about uh, ReLU is that it doesn't have an issue that the gradients are gonna vanish uh, at, at this region. But as you can suspect, uh, it seems like they could be vanishing over here. And this is called dying relus. When you get stuck in the inactive or zero parts of the relu function uh, where the gradient uh, is zero. And this uh, leaky relu and other uh, similarly called nonlinear functions are used to overcome this. I would say we still see relu quite a lot uh, and still it's the most common choice. So it seems like dying relus, although in theory they could happen, they don't happen maybe that often. All right, so these are our nonlinear functions. And as I kind of hinted now, we are going to stack them. And we are going to work with so-called deep neural networks opposed to shallow neural networks. And all we are doing here is extremely simple. I told you we have this nonlinear transformation of vectors. Mm -hmm. You're just going to keep nonlinearly transform these vectors. So you will do it once and you will get um, a vector for, from the original vector uh, that now lives in some uh, space that has been nonlinearly transformed um, the original uh, space. And then you are gonna keep transforming these spaces basically by giving the output of the previous nonlinear operation as an input to the current nonlinear operation. Then again, output of that second nonlinear transformation will be input to the third nonlinear transformation and so on. Basically, each one of these operations is called layer. And you know, terminology is quite loose. You can even say that um, linear transformation is one layer, then applying the nonlinearity is the second one. So you can say that each one of these are actually two layers. And here we see two times L layers rather than uh, L. Um, all right, so once we do this stacking, we have deep neural network. And basically this is where this terminology deep learning comes from, from the facts that these neural networks are gonna be deep and usually they have to be deep to reach uh, a good performance. And this is yet another visualization of how transforming uh, uh, your data in a non-linearly can uh, give you new space where these data points are linearly separable, which is the goal uh, we wanna do. Okay, so this is, this is, oh, sorry, go ahead. 
Mm. Yeah, you got me there. Um, yeah. Okay. Let me mark some this somehow. <laughs> All right. And capital L. Thank you. Yeah, please correct me. Uh, this this is great. Makes uh things more clear. Okay, so let's assume a uh, question for you. Uh, let's assume all of these matrices are d times n. Uh, what what do we get uh, at the end of all of these operations? What's the what's the output here? Is it the matrix? No. So yeah, th this is why I asked this question. So let's go over it again, uh, and maybe I'll stick with you. Uh, what did each one of these operations do? Just the transform in this space, right? So we still don't have anything about boundaries because we don't have classifier, right? We just got transformations of vectors, right? So again, what is the outcome here? A transform space more, more precisely, uh, since we started with the vector, we, we get the transformed uh, vector, right? So, so far, I told you just how to get nonlinear transformations of the vectors, but I did not tell you how to classify them, right? So we are missing that piece. And this is what we are gonna ta be talking about next. And as I give away here, the way we are gonna do this is with our logistic regression. Here, I want to do th two things at once. Might confuse you. I want to tell you how we can do classification at top of this nonlinear transformation. And I want to completely orthogonally to that, introduce the concepts of multi-class classification. So be extra focused because we are doing two things at once here. As I kind of hinted, we are going to be using logistic regression. So just to remind you, to define logistic regression, we use the sigmoid function. Here we have it again. Um, and then using the sigmoid function and the uh, dot products between the weights vector and the feature vectors, we have defined the probability of being either positive or a negative class. These were the elements we needed. Uh, to define logistic regression. Again, sigmoid and the dot product. Now, I want to extend this to multi-class classification. And this is a classification problem where we're no longer using, using just two classes, positive or negative. We have uh, many possible classes, uh, or not necessarily many, more than two. Can you give me an example of tax classification where classes are where we have more than two classes. Yes. What if we define this point at least that is a subject to the previously defined? Perfect. This would be something we call topic classification, it be in a very specific domains of assignments, but the the you know um, the different feature among these is just the topic. And this is when one very common example of text classification where we have multiple uh, classes, topic classification. Yep. Yeah, here we have many, many, many possible classes. And if we you know, uh, approach this as a classification problem, we would have as many classes as there are authors uh, in the world. Really hard problem, still very much unsolved. Yes. Named entity recognition. Yeah, that one is multi-class at the level of a word, which might be confusing if uh, no one has heard about it. But in a, if at a, sometimes we don't make decisions at the level of the entire text, rather we go word by word and try to classify. And this is one example. And yes, name, there are many types of entities as we are gonna learn later in the course. So here uh, we have seen now, uh, I think plenty of examples. 
uh, that shows that this is a real, a real problem. And here we have two different ways we can approach uh, building a multi-class classifier. Uh, and we are going to embrace the first one. In the first one, you are trying to, you have, let's say, M classes. For each one of these M classes, you are extending that notion of vector dot product we had before. However, to you have for each one of these M possible classes Y uh, that are in this output space capital Y, you have its own weight vector. So here I'm uh, denoting that as W, which has always been our way of denoting the weight vector. But in subscript, we have I because that says this is a weight vector specific for the uh, this, this class. We are also be going to use this terminology output space. It's going to mean the set of possible uh, classes. And uh, when you are looking for which class to predict, you are going to calculate, uh, for example, here, which is not probabilistic classifier, just a simple uh, classifier. You will check with the uh, which of the classes has the highest docked product with uh, our uh, feature vector, and then whatever is the class that has the highest uh, dot product between its weight vector and the feature vector, you say that's going to be my predicted class. So basically, what we are doing is repeating what we have done for binary classification for each class, and then predicting the one which has the highest value. Alternative would be that we have shared uh, weights, uh, but our feature representations, we have uh, multiple of them for each class uh, separately. And this is not what we are gonna be doing. We are going to embrace this first approach to multi-class classification. And we are going to extend our logistic uh, regression. Here, if you remember, our sigmoid had this is the equation for sigmoid. There are some exponentiation going on um, and so on. There is, um, yeah, not much going on, but there is this exponentiation. And maybe this is the first thing you notice. Oh, I, we are again uh, using the uh, this, this, this same function, but slightly differently. Um, so we are going to use this form uh, for our extension of the sigmoid. Uh, basically, we define a weight vector for each one of our possible classes. And we exponentiate the dot product between that weight vector and the feature vector. And here we are basically doing something similar, but we're doing it for each class and then summing the result. And this serves uh, as a, a normalization. Uh, we want all of these values uh, which we get as probabilities for a given class to then sum to one because we want to have notion of probability distribution. With binary logistic uh, regression, we did that very easily by defining what's the probability of being a positive class and then uh, defining the probability of the negative class as one minus that. So we had probability distribution by design. And here we are achieving that by introducing this normalization term. So here I'm giving you a few examples of what the dot product uh, in case of uh, having three classes uh, could be. Then when you apply this function to these values, you are getting these following values. And you can see that they sum to one, which is great. And you can see that those values that were really high also have the highest probability, which we, which we want. So this is, uh, this is good. And I kind of said we are providing you, I'm providing you with an extension of a sigmoid function. And I said this because what this is, is an uh, instance of a softmax, softmax function that takes a vector here, a vector of uh, size capital K, and then it, um, produces, uh, basically it exponentiates each one of the values and then normalizes. And it's effectively behaving similarly like sigmoid function. If you had a uh, softmax and uh, um, if when you have only one dimension is basically sigmoid. So we will be using the terminology softmax a lot. Uh, it's going to represent that that's our 
last step, last classification uh, step. Uh, because from these uh, functions, we are getting the probabilities. And then all we need to do is pick the class with the highest uh, probability, just like we did with the uh, logistic progression for binary classification. Yes, please. Uh, so when you go through each iteration of your common denominators, why do you have to normalize it? Wouldn't that be like a constant of each iteration? So the, like which, which, which higher Oh, okay. So yeah, so this is basically just to have this notion of probability as the as the last as thing. And you are right. We would get the same prediction if we didn't have the probability. Um, there are multiple reasons uh, for why we want to do this. Uh, for example, if we are using probability, then no negative log likelihood, minimizing it becomes same as minimizing something called cross entropy, which I should definitely mention the connection between two. With logistic regression and softmax and sigmoid, it's basically the same thing. So you are getting this nice equivalence of these two optimizations that we like in machine learning. Gonna make a mental note to uh, make that argument clearer the next time. So that's one reason. Um, then you get this probabilistic notion, which is easier to interpret sometimes. Like here, it is easier for me to say, oh, uh, I can think about is that this is the likelihood of seeing uh, this label with these kinds of uh, inputs is about 90%. Whereas with these, I don't know, is too much larger than minus one? I don't know because what these numbers means, right? I think there are also some uh, numerical stab stability reasons. I think if these numbers become too huge, it can also have effects on the training procedure. So I think uh, that also might uh, play an influence of why we have probabilities. But you are right, conceptually, we do get the same information. All right, so just to repeat, uh, what I have done now is kind of taking a little digression from our non-linear space uh, transformation to introduce the problem of, of multi-class classification. And then I extended the logistic regression from binary to logistic uh, to multi-class logistic regression by introducing softmax in place of the sigmoid. And uh, I want to uh, extra emphasize that here, uh, we are applying softmax to each one of these values uh, in the vector. So here, this is a softmax of that we get for the ith value in this vector z, meaning if I have if I give a k-dimensional vector as an input to a softmax, I'm going to get k-dimensional uh, uh, vector as an output. Okay, and you can also use in place of a sigmoid, which returns only a single value, you can use a softmax with two classes um, equaling to two, which is usually uh, what we uh, also do but it's gonna have the same effect as sigma. All right, so I'm gonna introduce notation I'm going to start using uh, more often. First, our output space, the space of all possible label is gonna be a vector i, where we have each one of the possible uh, labels listed. And then the probability uh, of predicting i label is going to be given by softmax um, value uh, at i position. Uh, I'm going to introduce now to simplify what well, this sausage here, I'm going to introduce a so-called uh, output matrix, where basically what I'm doing is stacking these weight vectors, which are corresponding to each one of the classes as rows uh, in this uh, matrix. So I'm just stacking them one over the other. And uh, now we can write this thing, which we needed to write for every single class individually, we can use vector notation to write it. So this thing equals this thing, basically, except that here um, you need to read it for every label independently, in a way. So this says the uh, output distribution over classes, so my probability distribution over these classes is given by softmax vector that's applied by to a vector uh, that we get by multiplying our output matrix with the feature vector. 
Notice that uh, the important part to realize here is when you have the outputs metrics, which is defined in this manner, where we just stack this uh, uh, class-specific weight vectors, in the first dimension of the resulting vector, you would get the same value you would get uh, by taking a dot product of the uh, of the weight vector of the first class by its feature vector. So it's the same thing. Mathematically, we are get, doing the same operations. Importantly for me also is that, again, softmax of, if we have more than one class, softmax is a vector. I, 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 that's a common mistake that I have seen students make. And now what we need to do to predict a class is take class, which has maximum probability in this probability vector. So this is called argmax operation. So everything I said on this slide is the same information I told you before in a more nicely, more elegantly uh, written uh, way. And with uh, deep learning and machine learning, we usually use these uh, vector notations. When we start to implement these things and use batching, we are going to move away from uh, matrices to tensors. So it's gonna be even a little bit more uh, complicated later. Okay, questions about multi-class logistic regression. I still didn't tell you what exactly we do after the nonlinear transformations in neural networks, but I guess you know where I'm heading, or I hope to, you do. Okay, so now we are going to define our feed-forward neural uh, network. We are going to define, again, our output space, set of possible label. And again, I'm going to define an output matrix uh, with each row corresponding to uh, one of the M possible labels we have. And here I am going to, for feed-forward neural networks, do this sequence of operations. I'm going to introduce my nonlinear transformation of the feature vector. So I have started with the feature vector. I have uh, done this operation. How do we call this operation? What does uh, this matrix do? Yes. Linear transformation. Whew, I thought I lost you completely. And then this will be a vector. And then uh, we are going to apply nonlinearity to each element of the resulting vector. And that's going to be our nonlinear transformation of the feature vector, a new hidden representation of the input. And this is the one we are classifying with our linear layer, with our linear classifier, which is basically logistic regression. Everything that comes after is just logistic regression. So we are first doing the, uh, the uh, we are uh, multiplying uh, the resulting vector with the output matrix and then applying softmax. This gives us probability distribution vector from which we take, predict the uh, class that has the highest probability. Okay, I'm gonna go over this one more time and visualize it. So we start with a feature vector and dimensional vector. What's the next thing we do with this vector? Linear transformation. Linear transformation, which is given by matrix vector multiplication. So this matrix is the uh, D times N. D is what we call a hyperparameter. This is a value uh, which we don't know a priori what it should be. It's an external variable that uh, we experts are gonna choose. And there, you know, we look at what other people do and we do so-called hyperparameter tuning, which I will talk about some other time. So once we do this, we have linearly transformed the feature vector. Great, now this is a vector that lives in this linearly transformed space and it is now of different dimension. It's, it's D-dimensional. Next operation is what? Nonlinear trans, uh, nonlinear transformation of this vector. Uh, so we apply some nonlinearity, for example, VLU to each one of the elements in this vector here. For example, VLU will just leave them as they are if they are positive, or put them to zero if they are negative. And now we get our representation, which lives in a nonlinear uh, space. 
And this is where our multi-class logistic regression comes in. So first step is going to be multiply this with, uh, you know, calculate dot product with corresponding class weight vector. You will get uh, m dimensional vector, which where m is the number of classes we have. You are going to then apply softmax to exponentiate each one of those dot products and normalize to get a notion of probability distribution. Again, softmax does not change the size of the vector that was given to it. So we still have m-dimensional vector. And from this one, we are fine doing argmax operation. We are finding which one, uh, which one of these um, uh, which one of the labels has the highest number, the highest probability in this vector, and that's going to be our predicted class. Yes? It's going to be a dumb question. No, no dumb question. The um, nonlinear transformation could potentially be a trick function, right? Yes. And then the softmax is like a summation regularized sigma functions. Mm -hmm. So it could be used Yes, except the difference is here, it can be just, just one clarification. Sigmoid is, can be used only when we have a binary classification problem and we must use softmax when uh, we have multiple classes. So sigmoid is not actually, like we don't use the terminology as if they are the same, but the, the notion is similar and that's I suppose what you wanted to say. Uh, and here, um, the, 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 uh, this one, uh, when we apply sigmoid, let's say here, we are applying it to much higher dimensional vector. Um, you know, effectively what's being changed is that here, um, we are not getting that probability distribution basically that, uh, that we have uh, been talking about before. Okay, so um, that's it. Uh, these things, let's go over terminology one more time. When we do nonlinear transformation, we'll be using hidden representation as a, as a vector. Uh, these things, uh, so when we apply the output matrix, dot, dot, pro, uh, excuse me, dot products between weight vectors and feature vectors are commonly called logits or logits. Uh, and then this whole procedure going from our feature vector to the uh, the final output is called forward pass, which we will contrast with the backward pass in just a minute. Yes. We can, we are not forbidden to do it. At this point of time, we no longer do it because now we know we are aware of this vanishing gradient problem and we know it's just gonna cause kind of numerical instability. I, I don't think you will see it anywhere anymore. Yeah, you'll see some versions of reals today. Yeah. But as an idea is not conceptually wrong, right? Like you can you can do it on the early neural networks. That was the most common choice. Okay. Actually I want to ask you here. Okay, so again, same as when we were thinking about logistic regression, uh, there were some parameters we had to learn, right? So I want to ask you, what are the parameters of these models? I would like you, if you know the answer, to read to me the actual, like how we name those weights here. Yes. Yes, exactly. Which kind of? So the, the, the name also gives away weights, right? So um, how we how we how exactly we linearly transform? I don't know. We need to find out through optimization. Uh, what exactly are the weights for the output? Again, we don't know. As with binary logistic regression, we had to find that out. Uh, so I'm denoting it with this little symbol here of you know needing to do uh, training uh, over here. So what we are going to talk about uh, soon is how to actually make these changes. Um, so I previously thought uh, the concept of embeddings uh, before I thought neural networks and realized that's not a great idea. I just want to give you a heads up and then you will learn more about embeddings in the next lecture. 
but those feature vectors we have learned with logistic regression, we will never be using with neural networks. And reason is that those vectors are very large, but very sparse. And what people have found out that neural networks hate sparse vectors. So starting with very sparse vector will give you a ton of numerical instability and training this model will be hard. Instead, we are going to start with shorter, let's say 300, 700 dimensional vectors. And we call them dense because they will have, there will be no zeros. There will just be continuous numbers, real numbers and no uh, zeros. And you will be, you always have two options when we don't work with pre-trained models. These starting feature vectors, once we learn them next time that we'll call embeddings, you can actually set to random values and you can learn them from the data that you have for training this model. So this one can also be considered the weight you need to learn for your uh, words that compose the uh, text or tokens, I should say, now that we know about subword tokenization. Um, or you can use something we'll learn next time, which is some fancy vectors, which we fix and uh, we don't change them. So just to want to mention here, it's going to be more clear uh, next uh, next time. Okay, and let's put all of this together. So we are starting with a sentence such as here, someone who loves predator, predator is a masterpiece. It has, so let's say we tokenize it in four, four tokens, predator is a masterpiece. And we have some feature representation of these uh, words that we then average together. Uh, and that gives us representation of the entire sequence. Um, this might be slightly confusing because, or very confusing because uh, last time we talked about feature vectors being directly produced without having feature representations for each token independently. That's gonna change next time. So if if it's confusing, why do we have uh, vectors for each one of the tokens? Ignore it for now and just uh, just focus on, on, on this part. This is our feature vector for our input uh, string. And then do you do this sequence of nonlinear operations and you do softmax. This is what in 2015 was called deep averaging network and it has been for the first time shown very successful for text classification purposes. This is actually gonna be your second homework. Um, you do need to you learn a few more things. You have about 80% of what you need and second homework is not released. I'm not gonna release it until the, uh, the deadline for the first one is finished, but just to kind of give you heads up, this is what you're gonna be implementing. Next time we are going to learn about these embeddings I hinted at, and then um, we are going to have PyTorch tutorial where you will learn a little bit more about library where you implement all of this learning stuff, and then you will be ready to go to implement something like this. All right, perfect, seven more minutes. Um, just to kind of go over what we talked about, we have started with the problem of I, in our space uh, that we started with, our classes data points are not linearly separable. We said, no worries, just non-linearly transform them. And then you will have something that's linearly separate, uh, we can linearly separate. And then we were extra happy because we just learned a week or so ago how to do uh, linear classification using logistic regression. But then I tricked you and I said, oh, no, no binary classification anymore. Now we are moving into multi-class classification and we learn how to extend uh, logistic regression with multi-class classification. And then with feed-forward ne uh, networks, we basically stack these two things together, non-linear transformation. And on top of them, we had multi-class uh, logistic regression. And now we need to know, learn how to actually find those weights. Remember when we were learning about logistic regression, I have actually calculated what the formulas for gradients are gonna be. And then we said, okay, if the true class is positive, then we are going to use this gradient. And if the class is uh, uh, negative, then we are gonna use this gradient and we are gonna plug it in the stochastic, uh, in mm, gradient descent. Okay, so that's what we did previously. And let's see, can we do that? here again. 
bringing a little bit more um, uh, matty way of writing things. It looks awful, but it's gonna be, uh, you'll survive. So uh, let's denote with I uh, star index of the gold label. So we had, uh, as we said, the output space are the order of our labels. And if the I class is the true label of an instance, then it lives in the I position of output uh, vector. Um, and we are interested, as we were with logistic regression, in the log probability of that class, or probability of our model predicting that class. Yeah. You can call it gold, true, or ground truth are very common ways. Yeah. Okay, so uh, log probabilities of the true gold ground truth label is what we are interested in. And we have uh, defined our probability with the softmax, right? Um, so we are almost looking for log of softmax, except that softmax is a vector. So to retrieve the i value of the vector, the way you can mathematically write it is if you define a vector which is zero, except everywhere, except on the i position. So basically what this uh, monstrosity says is uh, just retrieve the i position in this softmax vector. That's all it does. This is just a mathematical way to write it. Right. So we are still having our log likelihood as the as uh, as as uh, as a part of what we want to uh, minimize. Almost we want to minimize negative version of it. Uh, now, more awfully looking mad. Uh, reminder that softmax is given by this equation, which uh, exp uh, exponentiates the element and then normalizes it. And remember that when you have logarithm of a fraction, you can write it as a logarithm of the numerator minus logarithm of the denominator. That's just the property of the logarithm. That's basically what's what we do here. So when you have the logarithm of a numerator, which itself is e to the power of something, if you assume logarithm is a natural logarithm, what you end with is the thing you are exponentiating, and then minus logarithm of the, den the, the, the denominator. OK, so we have our log probability, and we want to minimize negative log probabilities as we as we did with logistic regression. Uh, what, what, did, what did we use then? What was the algorithm that we used to find the weights to that minimize negative log probabilities? Yes? Perfect, gradient descent. Uh, that was our logarithm uh, algorithm of choice. Oh no, now I'm going to switch algorithms and logarithms. Um, that was our algorithm of choice and it's going to remain some version of gradient descent to this date is going to be what we are going to use. This is the pseudo code we had for gradient descent. And now the issue with uh, using gradient descent uh, directly here is that we can compute um, the formulas I was giving you before with some modification for multi-class scenario can be used to find the gradient of our loss function with respect to output parameters. If we treat Z as a feature, basically nothing then changed except that Z is what we called feature vector before. The issue because starts when we want to know how to find the gradient of W1, which was our linear transformation. Like how do we go all the way there? And th we do that by using back propagation, uh, basically applying the chain rule. So we are interested to find what is the gradient derivative of the loss function with respect to the parameters W1, which were those that we used to linearly transform the feature vectors. And uh, it's important to recognize that we have composition of functions. So uh, to get to our loss function, we have calculated softmax, which uh, use the, uh, uh, the matrix uh, vector products of the output matrix with the uh, nonlinear representation. And nonlinear representation itself came from a series of mathematical operations. So it's a composition of functions. And when you have composition of functions, you use chain rule to get the derivative. I said, this is okay. This is, we are familiar with this one. 
This one is the then the gradient of the nonlinear function with respect to what I called A here, and A here is that linearly transformed vector. Okay, give me just one more minute. This is all great, but you might be terrified with, are we gonna calculate these things every time like we did with logistic regression? And good news is that you will not be doing that. This is what's gonna be handled for you uh, with the frameworks that we use to do this. So we are gonna learn about PyTorch and I'll just finish with this. This is uh, basically one code to train one neural network. All you will be doing is loss.backward. And that this function has something called autograd, a very nice framework, which is gonna calculate these gradients for us. And we are just gonna chill, not be calculating any of this. And uh, we will be able to do the gradient descent optimization. Okay, let's stop here. More to say about neural networks, but next time. Oh, 